Every April, a group of scientists observes the faint glow of asteroids passing by our planet. One year, they realized there was something weird shimmering in their telescopes. The team expected it to be another asteroid. But they ended up very surprised, because what they discovered was an unusual space rock that didn't consist of the minerals that usually make up asteroids. It was made of silicate, the material mostly found on the moon. They named it Kamo Oaliwa, which is a Hawaiian word that means wobbling celestial object. The rock didn't match any near-Earth asteroid scientists had already been familiar with. Instead, that piece had a pattern of reflected light similar to that of the moon rocks astronauts had brought back from NASA missions. This fragment turned out to be a quasi-satellite, which is a kind of asteroids that orbit both our planet and the Sun. It repeatedly circles Earth and has a quite unusual tilt. That's the reason you can only see it in the night sky once a year. The fragment is pretty shy, too. Aw, it never gets closer to our planet than 9 million miles. That's almost 40 times as far away as the moon. Plus, this space body often hides in the shadows. Scientists have figured out the piece won't stay in this orbit for a long time. It probably arrived at its current position about 500 years ago. And its orbit is likely to change in the next 300 years. This fragment may not be alone out there in space. Mm -mm. There are at least three more similar near-Earth objects. They may have all come from the same place. Researchers aren't sure yet about the nature of the rock, but they can find out more about this unusual space object if they send a spacecraft to collect samples and bring them to Earth. That's something China's space agency is planning to do later this decade. Now, the moon appeared in the middle of chaos. There are several theories about how that happened. The first one claims the moon used to be just a wandering body, similar to an asteroid. It formed somewhere in our solar system. Once, it approached too close to Earth and got captured by our planet's gravity. The second theory says that our planet was spinning so quickly that some material broke off and started circling around it. One of the largest pieces was the moon. The third theory says that the Moon was formed at a time when our planet was going through its own formation process. But today, the most widely accepted theory goes like this. Once, a long, long time ago, but not in a galaxy far, far away. Earth collided with a Mars-sized planet. The debris and clouds of dust from the collision gathered around our planet and started circling it. Eventually, something that we today know as the Moon formed there. Apollo missions brought more than a third of a ton of soil and rock from the lunar surface. These rocks show that the Moon had mostly the same building materials as our planet. This might mean they have a common history. If the Moon had been formed somewhere else and had been eventually captured by the gravitational force of our planet, it would have a different composition. Also, if it had been created at the same time as our planet or had once broken off, there would be the same minerals on both the Moon and Earth. But the minerals on the Moon contain less water. Plus, our planet's natural satellite is rich in materials that form fast at high temperatures. Now, the Moon isn't the only space body in the solar system with a mysterious past. Hippocamp is Neptune's moon, discovered in 2013. It's the smallest moon of this ice giant, a mere 21 miles across. It's very close to Proteus, the biggest of Neptune's inner moons. And no, Hippocamp is not a place for big African mammals to spend the summer. Scientists think Hippocamp probably formed from debris after Proteus collided with a comet. If Hippocamp had entered Proteus's orbit from some other place in our solar system, the bigger moon would have either swallowed it or booted the tiny moon away. But not even Proteus itself is among the first generation of Neptune's moons. It was formed from the remains of the planet's earliest system of moons. Those first moons were destroyed when Neptune captured Triton, currently the largest of its moons. The main evidence proving the collision was likely to happen is the fact that Triton circles around Neptune backward, unlike other moons orbiting the planet. Neptune captured Triton from the Kuiper Belt. That's an area filled with icy objects and rocky debris stretching beyond Uranus. That means Hippocamp is a third-generation moon, kind of like a second cousin twice removed or something. Now the Sun also had a turbulent past. Our star appeared about 4.6 billion years ago. It's hard to study its early stages of life since that happened 50 million years before our planet was even formed. But recently, a team of researchers has discovered crystals that are over 4.5 billion years old. Hidden deep within meteorites, 
they've revealed some things about the past of our Sun. Before the planets were formed, our solar system had consisted of a central star and a massive disk of dust and hot gas spiraling around it. As the dust and gases cooled down, they turned into minerals, including the crystals found in the meteorites that landed on our planet. Those ancient materials were irradiated, unlike some younger substances. Researchers think something might have happened to the Sun after those crystals were formed. Perhaps the activity of our star was less intense then. Or maybe, for some reason, these younger materials couldn't travel to the areas where irradiation was possible. Dwarf planets give us a chance to sneak a peek into the ancient years of the solar system. Around 4 billion years ago, Jupiter's, Saturn's, and Neptune's gravitational forces joined. They sent asteroids and comets hurtling across the solar system, making them collide with different planets. All the dwarf planets from the Kuiper Belt, for example Pluto, Eris, Haumea, Makemake, have their own moons that likely formed after some powerful collisions. Icy debris in orbits similar to Haumea's, for example, can prove the theory of an ancient collision. The debris it created simply didn't have enough energy to float away from the dwarf planet's gravitational pull. Ceres, another dwarf planet, has ammonia-rich clays on its surface. Ammonia isn't stable at the temperatures prevailing on Ceres. But there's plenty of this substance in the outer solar system. It means that Ceres was probably formed in those outer parts and got kicked inward. After all, the gas giants were migrating a lot at those early stages of the solar system. Or the dwarf planet could have formed in an asteroid belt, and ammonia somehow, let's say after a powerful impact, appeared on the dwarf planet. Ceres might help scientists understand icy moons better. The ocean floor on Earth has a high concentration of carbonate minerals, and some parts of Ceres have them too. This means this dwarf planet is like some sort of fossilized ocean world. Many exoplanets, a term used for planets outside the solar system, have also gone through pretty intense collisions in their early stages. This double star system is more than 300 light years away from us, and its stars are at least 1 billion years old. Even though it's not young, this system still shows some signs of swirling clouds of dusty debris that haven't cooled down yet, which isn't something you'd expect from a star system of this age. This debris is still warm. It means there might have been a strong collision of two planets or some other space bodies of similar size in that region and relatively recently. So hey, everybody just simmer down. Dust particles circle around a young star. They stick together and grow bigger with time. That's how planets form. The leftover dust often settles in some distant cold areas. An example in our solar system is the Kuiper Belt. It's located far away beyond Neptune. As solar systems evolve, those particles keep colliding until they're so small they end up being pulled into nearby stars or kicked out of the system. Uranus spins on its side if you compare it with the rest of the planets in our solar system. And the only way we can explain it is a powerful collision in the past. Something much bigger than a regular comet or some other space body of similar size likely hit Uranus and knocked the planet on the side. It was probably a planet twice the size of Earth. It could be a protoplanet. This is a space body made up mostly of ice and rock that orbits a star and is likely to develop into a planet sometime in the future. Anyway, the fallout from the impact smothered the core of Uranus. It prevented the heat inside the planet from escaping. This might explain why Uranus has extremely cold temperatures on its surface. <laughs> Man, bring a jacket and a blanket. Hey, you're running through a vast field at night, as if something is chasing you right now. The light of the full moon brightens your path, and you see a circle of light around it. You run on looking for a safe shelter. It's not about werewolves, who are said to appear when the moon is full. Soon, this place will be the epicenter of a major storm. This very circle around the moon is called a halo, and ice crystals cause it in the sky. When the moon is full, it reflects a lot of sunlight. These rays then pass to the Earth's surface, but they curve their trajectory and split as they pass through hexagonal ice crystals. As a result, we have a halo of different colors, almost like a rainbow. The inner edge of the halo is red, and the outer edge is blue. It looks beautiful, but the presence of ice in the clouds means this ice will soon turn into water and begin to fall to the ground. And this rain will be so heavy that you'd better find a shelter beforehand. If the weather is quite warm and the clouds are closer to the ground, you might see a similar phenomenon, a corona, 
It's much smaller than a halo, but much more colorful. The bluish-white disc on the inside turns brownish-red on the outside. Unlike halo, the corona is made of water droplets. The smaller these drops are, the larger the corona will be. If the water droplets are large, the corona will look like a bright spot the size of the moon itself. Both the corona and halo might also occur during the day when the sun is shining. But be sure to wear sunglasses before just glancing at it, because it's very bright and really bad for your eyes. As soon as you find a shelter, it starts raining heavily. Whoa, what is that? Are you being photographed? No, the flash you just saw is lightning. Bam! Thunder is so strong, the windows in the house start to shake. Here's a tip on how to tell if you're far away from the epicenter of a thunderstorm. When you see lightning, start counting. 1 1,000, 2 1,000, 3, and so on. When you hear the thunder, stop counting. Now you have to divide that number by 5. If you can count to 5, it means the epicenter of the thunderstorm is 1 mile away. If you didn't find a shelter before the thunderstorm started and it caught you in the open, leave the high ground immediately. Any mountain or hill is a high-risk area. Don't even think about hiding under a tree. Tall objects are the first target for lightning. Power poles are also at risk. If a thunderstorm catches you riding a bike, drop it immediately and run away. Same if you were riding in a convertible, golf cart, or motorcycle. If a thunderstorm started while you were in an open field, the tallest object here is you. Get down and try to cover yourself somehow. If you're not alone, try to keep your distance from each other. Whew! Now, let's admire the beautiful sunrise. It looks like someone spilled red paint on the sky. This beautiful view means it's about to start raining. You can see a red sky at sunrise because the high-pressure zone has just passed you by and is now followed by a low-pressure zone with high water content in the air. So take an umbrella with you or go back to a warm bed and stay indoors. There's an old saying to keep it all straight. Red sky in the morning, sailor take warning. Red sky at night, sailor's delight. Sometimes you can even predict rain by smelling it. It's all about ozone molecules. Storm currents bring ozone down from the upper atmosphere. And when the storm is about to start, you can smell a sense of cleanliness. It's like you just washed the floor with clean water. Your sense of smell gets more sensitive before it starts to rain. It's not because of your nose, but because of the more humid air. Flowers spray their scent, and the water molecules stick to it, spreading it much better. That's why the same flowers smell different when you smell them outside or in a closed, humid greenhouse. Plants can also help you predict changes in weather. If you touch the grass in the morning and it's wet, it means it's going to be a clear day. That morning water on the grass is dew. It appears at the coldest time of night. Clear skies allow the earth to cool a bit, and the water vapor molecules in the air turn into a liquid that settles on various surfaces. Take a closer look at the leaves on the trees. Sometimes they can be upside down. For example, maple leaves respond well to increased humidity before the rain. Their stems become very soft, and the wind can turn them upside down. But the best indicator is pine cones. The seeds are inside the cone, just under its scales. The pine needs to keep them as dry as possible so that the wind can carry the seeds far away and new trees can emerge from them. So when the pine senses rain approaching, it gives the order to close the cones. Then the scales close, protecting the seeds from the water. And instead of boring weather forecast hosts, you can just follow the animals and insects. Have you heard the crickets chirp? That will be your thermometer for today. Set the timer for 15 seconds and count how many times crickets chirp. Add 37 to that number and you get the outdoor temperature value in Fahrenheit degrees. All because air temperature directly affects crickets' metabolism. It can chirp slower and faster depending on how warm it is. So throw away your thermometer and get yourself a little friend. Now, if you don't like insects, look up into the sky for birds. If they're flying high, it'll be a clear and sunny day. But before it rains, air pressure prevents birds from flying high. You may see them flying in flocks very low, most likely looking for shelter. So even if the sky is clear, air pressure tells you that rain is coming. If you live near a river or lake, you can hear toads singing, although you can't quite make out the lyrics because it's in toad. They are especially loud before it rains hard. Toads, in general, love wet weather, so they just get excited. Rain is also the best time for females to lay eggs, so they scream loudly in search of a guy to wed. Ow! A mosquito has just bitten you. 
if mosquitoes are being especially aggressive, you better find a shelter fast. The insects are just trying to eat more before they have to starve during the storm. Also, the warm, humid air makes us sweat more, and we become even more attractive to mosquitoes. Insects also gather in swarms before a thunderstorm. They love the moisture in the air and start circling in a dance. But then they vanish into thin air. It means you have one hour left before heavy rain starts. To predict the weather for the next day, you need to watch the bees. If it rains tomorrow, the bees work overtime. They're pollinating flowers actively because they know they won't be able to leave the hive the next day because of the rain. Squirrels can predict the weather for the whole season. They usually stock up on food for the cold times. And if they start doing it early, it's going to be a tough winter. You can see squirrels running around looking for acorns. They hide them in the ground and run to find the next one. The squirrels often forget where they hid the food. These acorns turn into little sprouts, so we have many new trees, all thanks to squirrels. Animals can also predict disasters like earthquakes. Scientists once did a study in an area with frequent earthquakes in Europe. They put trackers on cows, dogs, and sheep. About 18,000 earthquakes occurred there during that time. Most of them were insignificant, but there were also 12 with a magnitude of 4 on the Richter scale. And each time before the earthquakes, researchers recorded strange animal behavior. It was as if they were trying to escape from the earthquake zone. Scientists believe animals can sense the ionization of the air before a disaster with their fur. Their good sense of smell also allows them to smell gas. It comes from moving deep underground and then trying to find its way out through small cracks in the surface. The first records of such animal behavior date back to ancient Greece. Cats, rats, snakes, and centipedes left their homes and fled to safety days before a major earthquake hit Greece. Some fish can predict the weather in the area. If sharks hang out near the shore, they're not necessarily looking for food. They may be hiding from a big storm at sea. The worst sign on the coastline is when all the water starts to go back abruptly. You can see the entire shoreline and even the fish and coral that are left on the land. Run away immediately, because soon a huge tsunami wave will come here and wash everything away. In the near future, people have made the greatest space discovery in history. The entire population of Earth looks up to the sky to see the greatest astronomical show ever. Is this real? What does it mean? Scientists have been studying galaxies, planets, and black holes millions of light years away. But all this time, something fantastic has been hiding in plain sight right above our eyes on the Moon. Starting a few years ago, humans began going to the Moon again and finally set up a permanent base there. While excavating the lunar landscape, one lucky drill smashed into something like a metal plate. It turns out that metal contains polycarbonate, aluminum, gold, and silver. Hmm, that's very similar to something humans already have on Earth. It's basically what CDs are made out of. People start going excavation crazy. Who knows what else is down there? The moon turns out to be our greatest resource. After a few months, lunar construction equipment has excavated several hundred feet of the shiny surface. At first, it was kept quiet, but a year later, that becomes impossible. Excavation crews dig out a huge rectangular shiny piece, the size of 10 football fields. And that plate is not alone. There are literally millions of them. After a little more research, scientists discover that the entire surface is covered with this strange material. People gaze up every night at the unusual moon in the starry sky. It glows a little brighter than before. You only need the most ordinary telescope to see that things are about to get weird. The excavation work isn't complete, but scientists have concluded that the moon is a huge disco ball. Who created it? For what? And what does this mean for us humans? No one has any answers. Soon, humans manage to dig up more than half of the moon. In some places, the plates are too deep to get to. They're stuck under mountains. In other places, the plates of the disco ball lie directly under the surface. Somehow, even with this crazy discovery, the properties of the moon haven't changed in any way, except that it's become brighter. Attempts to dig deeper, to pierce through the plates, are hopeless. The layer of polycarbonate and metal alloys is too thick and seems to go deep into the core of the moon. Some scientists suggest that if the moon's surface resembles a CD, it might just mean that there's some information recorded on it. That would change the course of history. They decide to build a laser reader to see if the moon really is a whopping big CD. 
Meanwhile, the drilling continues. On the dark side of the moon, which isn't always dark by the way, people find a small crater. Surprisingly, there's no shiny material inside. This perfectly round hole looks like a dried up lake. At first, everyone assumes that there was a plate there. It just must have flown off somehow. But then, why was that crater so perfectly round? After a little more investigation, diggers find something that looks like plastic. What's that all about? Then, unexpectedly, the digging stops. The huge rig smashes against a thick alloy of unique durable plastic. There's a perfectly round plastic disc hiding inside the crater, the only one on the entire moon. It becomes clear that this huge disco ball was created by some one, some thing, billions of years ago. It's been covered with cosmic dust ever since. IT specialists scan the entire lunar surface with the help of satellites. They find something. It looks like there's a complex electronic system hidden under the disk. If you look at the moon as a whole, the crater starts to look an awful lot like, well, a button. Time to press play on the moon. To understand what's going on there, scientists try and try to get through the plastic layer. While they're doing that, There's an accident. An automatic drill explodes under insane pressure. The blast is so strong that it activates the button. All of humanity freezes in fear. There's silence. Real silence. Then it happens. The moon starts to rotate ever so slowly on its axis. Then, hour after hour, it rotates faster and faster. There's a mad rush to get everyone off the moon. Soon, it'll be spinning too fast to take off from safely. A lot of people fly halfway across the planet, where it's night, to see what's up with the moon. Every TV channel, website, blog, vlog, live stream, everyone's broadcasting the same images. Those of the great disco ball in the sky. The moon begins to spin so fast that all the loose rock and sand on its surface gets scattered in different directions. Some lunar fragments fall on Earth and create an incredible meteor shower. The moon is spinning faster and faster. Now it looks like a real disco ball. The night sky is lit up with bright rays of white. It's incredible. People are ecstatic, amazed, delighted. But a moment later, all of humanity descends into a deep state of fear. Astronomers report that the moon is approaching Earth. When it gets too close, Earth's gravity will destroy it, and the giant crushed-up disco ball will smash into our planet. Every hour, the moon gets bigger in the night sky. Floods are starting to break out all over the world. People dust off their underground bunkers and get inside. There's no time to blast the moon with a rocket or anything like that. This could be it. The moon creeps closer and closer to the Earth's atmosphere. Then, it stops, and nothing happens. Incredible! The disco ball isn't affected by our planet's gravity. Some sort of ancient technology inside the moon just saved us from disaster. Then, a deafening sound booms out from the night sky. It's coming from the disco ball. The sound wave obliterates all the clouds in the sky. It sounds like a roar, a deafening bass that makes the ground shake. It's intimidating, scary, but then a rhythm starts to come out from the wall of sound. Impossible! There's music coming right out of the moon. Then some plates start to change color. They turn purple, pink, blue, green. It looks wild. The different color rays dance around on the Earth's surface. It gives everyone an insane energy boost. Everyone wants to be outside with friends, neighbors, anyone. One moment, you're standing under a green glow, and a second later, everything around you gets lit up in pink. The incredible light show creates an unbelievable desire to dance. DJs around the world team up to record a whole new sound that mixes with the moon's music. They call it MLB, the moon light beat. People all over the world go out into the streets and kick off the biggest party ever. Scientists now think that billions of years ago, our planet was inhabited by huge intelligent beings the size of Mount Everest. They wanted a party and set about creating a huge disco ball. Then these creatures moved on to another planet. Earth was getting kind of cramped. And the disco ball was simply forgotten. Over millions of years, dust and rock obscured it from view. For several months, the moon continues to spin, and DJs keep pumping out music people start to get a bit tired of the whole thing. 
They want a bit of silence and a calm starry sky, not a glittering moon disco ball. Humanity starts experiencing mass insomnia and dizziness. All flights are grounded because the bright colored flashes make it impossible for pilots to see properly. Unfortunately, no one knows how to turn this thing off, and it's impossible to study because the moon's moving around too fast. The problem is solved by itself. The ball stops and returns to its orbit. It's possible that it just ran out of battery. People aren't exactly in a rush to reactivate it, but they leave detailed instructions for their descendants in case they want to throw a global party.